Thank you. It's so nice for us to be here today and talk about a paradigm shift. What a great job you guys have done with your school. And uh, we get a chance to be participating with it and to weave what we do into this program here you guys so nicely established. So it's so nice to be here with you today. So a paradigm shift in the learning process. What if we had a chance to change and to improve the method with which we learn? And what if we had an opportunity to intentionally incorporate a proven method of learning into our study process? What if we could retain and recall a higher percentage of information that we learn in our degree programs? We know that in our graduate school training, we are using, in large part, the, the um, uh, semantic memory part of our brain where we are required in our programs to encode and recall a ton of inf uh, information, facts, concepts, ideas, problem-solving skills. So what if we could infuse our learning process with theories of learning that would enhance our retention and make the learning process an effective and efficient one? And what if we could take a program like this with these theories and seamlessly integrate it into the learning process? So these theories we're talking about, theories like the chunking and clustering theory, where we can group and link similar terms for easier memorization and for uh, recall. How about the interference theory, where we know that we can uh, arrange the learning process such that more newly learned information doesn't interfere with past information, and it doesn't disrupt in any way the console, uh, console um, uh, consolidation process, thank you, with a memory process either. We also have a laboratory rehearsal, which is a memory technique that focuses on the thinking about the meaning of the information that you're trying to learn. Or space learning, as Barb was talking about earlier. Space learning, spaced schedules of learning we know that involves layering information over time, layer upon layer, enhances our retention and our recall. And supported reading, reading with the support of recorded materials, it increases our comprehension skills, and we know for those that have some difficulties <coughs> with it related to uh, reading, any learning disabilities, it can really benefit them, as well as those that tend to be more auditory learners, they benefit as well. And with regards to acquiring information, the research shows that those that use supported reading tools can increase their learning of print-related material by 38%. That's huge. Mind mapping. Mind mapping simply enhances strategic thinking and our effectiveness. And a mind map is a customized blueprint or an outline, if you will, that organizes the core information, the most important information that you're trying to recall and learn. <coughs> Barbara talked about the mediator effectiveness hypothesis and the testing effect. We know that incorporating testing into our learning process enhances our learning and our memory. So what if we incorporated testing into the learning process all throughout what you're going to be doing? The mediator effectiveness hypothesis talks about how we create and generate more effective mediators through testing. Mediators, uh, mental hints, cues, information that links cues to targets through the testing process. And also the testing effect in which involves long-term memory being enhanced through the retrieval practice that takes place after reading and through testing. The primacy and the recency theories. Well, we know that positional factors influence our recall and impact our recall. So what if we were to take our content and organize it intentionally such that we can enhance that part of our learning? So what if we could take this new paradigm of learning with these theories that I'm describing here and have the vast body of knowledge in psychology distilled down for us and grouped into a method of learning that walks us through a guided, pre-arranged, step-by-step method of study? Thank you, Graham. I just want to take a moment to address administrators. You know, as we look at anything new that we're implementing, we're wondering why, what's, what is the reason behind it? The Association of State and Provisional Psychology Boards, the ASPPB, is the company that creates and maintains the licensing exam for psychology, the EPPP. The ASPPP in 2010 released the licensing pass rates of all school and psychology programs in the United States and Canada. From that point on, a school's licensing pa pass rate has been made public. Also, we have accreditation. Regional, national, and programmatic accrediting bodies look to the licensing pass rate as a measurable learning outcome on whether you're going to achieve or maintain accreditation. The U.S. Department of Education now 
It's looking at pass rates. They want to, they're looking at pass rates to evaluate accrediting bodies. So we know that schools are accredited, the accrediting bodies are, are going to evaluate those schools, but the accrediting bodies themselves are being evaluated. They get their authority to accredit by the U.S. Department of Education or CHIA, Council on Higher Education. So now the Department of Education is looking to the accrediting bodies to make sure the schools under them maintain an appropriate licensing pass rate. Mm. So in all levels of evaluation, the EPPP licensing pass rates of schools is seen as an important outcome measure. For approval with the, the U.S. Department of Education, it's also important for schools because it allows schools to use federal <coughs> financial aid. We know that with accreditation, we also need to prove the amount of time, at least some measure of amount of time a student spent learning. What if there was a simple, hmm, I may have been hitting slides randomly here. I did yours, but I didn't do mine. Um, well, we'll stay here. What if there was a simple, effective, sustainable solution to everything I just described right now? What if we could look at these objectives, have a program integrated into your, your education system that assures the main aspect we always look for, that students receive all the core information of psychology they need in order to be effective in, the professional, in, in professional psychology, in practice. But what also if we had an outcome measure to use for accreditation and approval of the Department of Education, that license that's only one of many measurable outcomes within the Taylor Study Method, but it's one of the most important ones. And what also, if your school was able to demonstrate time spent learning all in one program. All right. So professors, what if there was an opportunity to have an early stage learning uh, opportunity for your students that would enhance their learning over time? by identifying and highlighting the core content that makes up the EPPP during their coursework with you throughout their academic journey. And what if a program like this would allow you to run your program as normal? In other words, there wouldn't be any change to a school's curriculum or to a school's theoretical orientation. You as a professor would get to teach your course as normal in your own teaching method. Students could easily integrate the material into their weekly studying the content itself could be easily incorporated and seamlessly incorporated into your weekly course syllabi. And what if a program and a process like this was acceptable to APA? So as a professor, you'd have a chance to run your course as normal with the assurance that the critical core content on the EPPP was being presented to your students. And students would get an opportunity to practice with the material during their tenure with your program and be given an opportunity for greater content mastery through the space learning opportunity. And students, what if there is something for you as well? Students, you're studying right now to become part of a community, a wonderful community of individuals committed to bettering people's lives and working with people to help them discover their design, help them reach their potential, and help them deepen their capacity for a relationship. And what if in your studying, you had a chance to enhance the whole process, to increase your proficiency, to make the process something that you have a deeper understanding and appreciation for for our field. And you get to have a kind of a first-hand understanding early on about what's going to be on your later test. One thing Barbara had talked about was, you know, the practical uses of psychology. And I think we forget how practical psychology is. Psychology offers effective strategies for child development, parenting skills, effective communication, business management. It's full of useful tools that sometimes we forget to use in our everyday life. What if you could use the tools from psychology in learning and memory throughout your academic experience? Oh yes, my fun story for students. Um, if, you, if you're in psychology, you're in the classes, you know that it's very difficult to retain all the information you learn. Just think of how much you remember about a class the day after the final. 
it's very common that we learn and learn and learn and feel like we forget everything. I usually start counseling theory class off with, you will probably forget most of what you learn. So if you do, at least you know you're normal. It's so difficult to remember all of the different, the different theories, who they belong to, who the theorists are, and what the techniques are that are incorporated in the theories. Your hope is that you get the theories again and again in various classes, and in the end, you figure out how to retain some of that information. And I say some because typically you have to use it or teach it in order to really retain all the information in the various theories. What if there was a way to retain most of what you learn in a classroom environment? Let me address those that are going to be going for licensure with their master's degrees or their doctoral degrees at the end of their gradu uh, upon graduation. We often get asked, is it too early to start now in your graduate program for your future EPPP licensure? And the answer is an emphatic no. We know that any time we have an opportunity for early stage learning, it just benefits people. As Dr. Grime was saying, I do a lot of uh, uh, coaching and some sports psychology, uh, which is an extension of back in the day when I got a chance to play. So I still get to have my hand in the game a little bit. And I really enjoy watching youth come through our program. And so this idea of early stage learning is like two young boys who want to play on my team in high school when they're very, very young. One picks up a ball and begins to dribble and pass and shoot from the age of eight. The other one decides to start practicing for the high school team when he's, in, when he's a uh, teenager. Well, which one is going to have a greater comfort with the game, more proficiency, and be more competent overall? Well, obviously the one that starts early. We also know that when we start early with something, we get to reduce our anxieties, and we get to reduce some of the uh, struggles that come with anything that has some anxiety around it. And this test will have some anxiety around it for you. So if we could think about reducing our anxiety, what's the uh, idea of anxiety? The definition of an anxiety is one that I use in my practice, is the perception of a threat and the perception I'm not going to be able to handle that threat. The key word is what? Perception. It's the meaning I give to that threat. And if we can address something early, I begin to see what that threat is really about and realize it's really not all that bad. And in fact, I can really control some things along the way, reducing my anxiety, increasing my proficiency, increasing my mastery and my content uh, uh, skills. The benefit of early stage learning is that we get to find out now what's going to be on our future test. That allows us, again, to have that mastery and reduce our anxieties. You know, when, when you're talking about anxiety, real quick, I just want to talk about a little piece in neuropsychology. Um, you know that when you stress, you activate your sympathetic nervous system, which when outcome is to decrease activity in your prefrontal cortex. So right when you're ready to use all the inf information you just studied for and your license and exam, if you add stress, your thinking brain's turned off doesn't go well, <laughs> doesn't go well together. So what if you could be studying throughout a long period of time, feel confident in the material, and actually take the test with your prefrontal cortex working properly? <laughs> that would be exciting. <laughs> Very good. Let me speak to the alumni just for a second. Those that have graduated, those, the, that, that lucky group who's gone through all the heavy lifting and hard work of school thus far. Um, your task now in preparing for your licensure is to build upon your graduate education. And your main task right now is really the memorization process, taking all that information, consoling it into more into your long-term memory, and becoming better and better and master test takers. I was talking with Toby about that earlier. Test mastery is so important, <coughs> as well as the memory and the mastery of the content. For those that are going to be sitting for the licensure soon, what if you had a chance to Take this graduate education that you had and to build upon it in a very specific way. What if you had a chance to have a customized review that's based off of an initial assessment exam that allows you after a year or two years when you're eligible to sit for your exam, find out where your current strengths and weaknesses are. And then have that, this course of review based around that with very strategic and properly placed additional testing opportunities to really help you develop that mastery and that sense of competence to sit for your exam. Well, we've teed everything up here for you with a lot of what ifs and kind of highlighting the things that we really want to come at for this exam. And what we've done at the Taylor Study Method is to set up a program to help you accomplish all those what ifs from students to alumni to uh, professors and also for administration. What we've done is we have organized 
all the information that we know makes up the base content, base knowledge of psychology uh, as determined by the ASPPB. They're the ones that own and manage the licensing exam, the EPPP. And we've distilled down this content that we know comes up on this exam and we've created lessons that a school pairs with their weekly curriculum. The idea behind this, as Julie talked about earlier, is for accreditation pro uh, purposes and also for licensure outcome measures. And again, the ASPPB's 2010 pass rates really heightened the need to really pay attention to what a school's pass rates are. Let's go to the next one if you could, great. So our goal as a company is to try and reinforce the key content, as Barbara was saying earlier, the key content in the field of psychology. And we want to guarantee that you have a chance to pass your future EPPP by preparing students early during their tenure with your school. And as well, to meet accreditation measures. So what we've done, we've taken all the content that we know comes up on the test, around 800 key terms. And this is a, an example of what we do. This is all the, uh, just a handful of key terms in the domain of abnormal. We take these and we organize them into lessons that I'm gonna go over in just a minute. But the way that the student accesses this, they will go to their member homepage with their school and they will scroll down to the part where they can click on uh, with us. We've woven it all into their, into their program. And we, they will see it in their weekly syllabi come up as a student activity or a study activity. When they click on that link, they're taken to this area right here. It talks about what's going on in this course. It's all done by course. They'll go down to the bottom and click on the week for the week that they're on. And they'll be taken to their Taylor Study Method member homepage. Anything we want to weave in so far? Hmm? Anything we want to weave in so far about that process? Just the idea is to make it as easy for schools to integrate this without a student even noticing something's much different. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'd like to go to a broad perspective to remind you all of the information somebody typically crams for in four months before the test. That's the normal, right? You graduate, you forget everything. Two years later or three years later after, you're laughing. <laughs> She's preparing right now for her exam. So you, you do get into clinical, you get excited about the profession, you forget the details, then your test comes. So you spend, if you're lucky, four months or so, usually spending a fortune and cramming all this information that, that, that you may not have a context for at any point. So if what, what this is doing is taking all that normal cram information, because we, we started with that. Taylor Study Method started as a prep for the time frame when you're cramming. All that information stretched out over two, three, four years, depending on how long you use this program. Layer after layer after layer. And then to come in and see it seamlessly integrated into your, into your classroom by clicking a button, opening up, reading, taking a test, you know, we'll go through all the different avenues on it. But to me, I, I have to say, I mean, now I am the project manager for Taylor Study Method, but it started with me falling in love with Taylor Study Method by studying for my EPPP. I felt like other materials I would read and forget everything I just read. And when I started reading Taylor Study Method, how they have it in little sections, building off each other, building a context, I felt like the information was retained. And what was exciting is it's retained long term. So people get irritated at me at how much knowledge I have. I'll just, did you know this? Just little facts about you know, well, when you scream, you're activating your kid's you know, sy uh, sympathetic nervous system, and unless you guys make up, it stays on. You know, just little tidbits of information uh, that I use in psychology as a clinician. So for me, that's, that's what got me so excited and, and why I've wanted to do anything I could to be partnered with them because it's exciting and it works and, it, and it's effective. So I did pass my licensing <laughs> exam also. So I'm also proof. So, so that maybe gives you a big picture of how exciting it is. Then you see, you know, step by step these little classes, but these classes are part of something huge. Let's talk about the classes. So when a, when a member clicks on their homepage, they're taking like just one more. Yep. Right? Yeah, thanks. Uh, they're taken to this right here. This is the weeks for your semester. And what you'll simply do is click on this again. It's all click and point and click and here we go. You're taken to something. And as we go through this, what I like to do is kind of identify some of the, uh, the learning theories that we talked about earlier. Here's where we begin to chunk and cluster. First of all, we started by domain. A lot of times people think, well, if I'm going to learn a little bit of ethics in the afternoon and some test construction, you know, and then I'll polish it off with, you know, um, psych assessment in the evening. 
now we're going we're gonna to be in, we're going to be raising interference theory around that. So let's not do that. Instead, let's organize all of our domains so that we learn information thoroughly, hold that, and then go to the next one. So the learning doesn't interfere as much as it could if we were doing it doing in a more um, uh, erratic way. So we've broken down the uh, by domains to start with. We've assigned it to your classes. You'll click on that week. You'll be taken but to this right here. Real quick, did you purposely put anxiety up there? Anxiety in the limbic system, that's the first time I noticed. There you go. Did you do that on purpose? I, yes, I okay. did. <laughs> yes, quite I did. Appropriate. I'll click the next I one did. Now. Yeah, so you will click on, you'll click on the, the, those are five key terms. So we've got the whole domain, five key terms, and, we're, and that's what a study session is. It's a, a block of five key terms. When you click on that first key term, you're going to be taken to a narrative. This is acetylcholine. And you're going to be given a, a, a narrative definition that gives you a nice, first of all, a nice synopsis of what the, that key term is about. And then they're going to go into various other paragraphs about the important areas of acetylcholine. Let me go off on a little bit of a tangent. So for example, let's say this key term was about um, confidentiality. Well, the test is not going to be nice enough to say, hey, what is confidentiality about? They're going to weave it into a, 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 a confusing question and a kind of a vague question. But they might ask you about confidentiality. But they're going to ask you about confidentiality in the context of HIPAA or Terrasa treatment of a minor, court order subpoena, how do you respond to a, to a, uh, to a court order evaluation? What do you do in couples therapy when they both divorce and now they're asking for their records and they're fighting against each other? So you're not going to get to know just about the key term, you're going to have to know the other topic areas that make up that key term. Did you want to mention the listening factor here with that uh, learning theory right in there? Go ahead, I'm going to listen to you talk about the listening factor. Well, you know, uh, yeah, he, he had talked about that supported reading. That you, you have a couple options here, but with each key term, there's a narrative, an audio narrative. So you, you know, have access to it on your phone and any device with that, audio, that um, auditory feature. But with this, you can read it once, go back, listen while you read, and that's the 38% retention. Um, improve retention with that supported reading. You can also just listen to it everywhere you drive and you know just use that auditory feature in general but that's something that's built into each key term that you're going to be studying. You know what sometimes when you, you develop something and then you go back and you look at it the narrative feature was something that came after some of the other uh, construction of this program and then I went back into some of the research on it and I got really excited. 38 percent that's a huge number a huge number. We also have a number of students that go through our program that have dyslexia, that have learning dis uh, reading disabilities. Bright psychologists, we were talking about them this morning at coffee. Bright psychologists have a tremendous capacity to contribute and already are to our field. But oftentimes this gatekeeping test keeps them hindered because the study materials tend to be just hard copy reading and test taking materials. So if they can have this material read to them while they're reading, it makes that whole process much more effective and also benefits those that tend to be more auditory learners. Okay, so they'll read that and then they get to a part where there's a flashcard. This is a candidate flashcard. This is all going to be online for you as well. And this flashcard is editable, meaning you can go in, you can highlight it, change the font, underline, you can do anything you want. And then you can also print this out. In that this is an online system, this whole program is like having an app available to you either on your computer or on your iPhone, your Blackberry, and you can access it anywhere you want, from your flashcards to your narratives. It's all available to you uh, online. This is a mind map we were talking about earlier on. It's a customized blueprint, if you will, of the core areas that are discussed in the paragraphs for that narrative definition, that key term. So in adrenal, in a, uh, with the adrenal glands, it's like an outline. It gives me a, a, a visual memory of what do I need to know for that. So the way that I was able to call back what was on the confidentiality, because I had a mind map in my head. I had to know what those areas are. I get to know that when I go to my test. One of the things we do with our program is we try and teach people to become better test takers as well. We won't go into that too much today, but you will see in your program an area that says exam strategies. And you can click on that, and we go over a number of things, learning and uh, different memory techniques in addition to what we're talking about here, like recitation and higher order thinking. That's all covered in that exam strategies. But we also go over something about some of the test taking opportunities and how to think about it. Um, and the mind map is real helpful around that, and I think it'd be real beneficial. So what you do at the end of, uh, end of those five key terms, can you go back to this one sure. real quick? That's right. When you finish these five key terms right here, you're going to go to a part where you get to take a practice exam. Now, this is a mediator effectiveness hypothesis and the testing effect coming into play. 
Why? Because we know that if we incorporate testing with the learning process, it enhances our long-term retention and begins to make some of those um, uh, uh, mediators much more effective for us. So we get to take a practice exam on those five key terms. And there are three key terms, uh, three questions for each of those five key terms. Each test will be 15 questions long. A question has uh, the question itself, four chances to uh, uh, A, B, C, and D, just like the exam itself. And you have a chance to check your right or wrong answer. It will tell you there. And also give you a rationale as to why the correct answer is correct and also why some of the, uh, the other answers were incorrect. Trying to help you learn. It's one more, one more phase of learning, which is very, very helpful. Great. The domain summaries uh, is kind of like a... Um, kind of like a master cheat sheet, if you will. We've taken all the flashcards and we've distilled those down into kind of a domain summary. It's a sweet little uh, uh, aspect of our program that has all the domain summaries and all 11 domains that you're gonna be learning, the core critical content in this field, right there laid out for you. You can go to your flashcards if you want, or if you're riding the bus or the train like Julie was today, and if she was studying for exam, she could call, call up this domain summary on her, on her Blackberry and review all the, all the important aspects of those key terms that you're gonna be questioned on. We also want to, uh, I, I talked about earlier, for students, you folks are involved in this new community that you're being uh, welcomed into and you're developing into. You're part of a, you're, you're really in a professional development process right now as a student that is gonna last your whole career. And so we want to begin to connect you more and more, not just with your school here, but with other psychologists. And one of the ways that we get to do that is through a TSM EPPP forum that we have. This forum is uh, 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 moderated by a couple of licensed psychologists that have worked with us for a while. Questions get raised, tips get given, strategies get conveyed, and just kind of the day-to-day, -day, hey, how's it going being a student of this school? How's it going being a student of your school? So that's what this forum is about, and that's part of uh, the membership as, as being a student in your school as part of this program also. Our resource room. This is a fun, uh, a fun window for us. We have a, a number of things available for students from uh, what is, what is uh, going on at other universities uh, to starting out a professional career, maybe even for some of those that are, who are learning or uh, preparing to retire even now as they get into a career. So there's all kinds of things here that you can learn. It talks about the ASPPB, um, some links there to sign up for your exam, making it very simple for you to do so and find out more about them if you have questions about it. Anything else you want to say about the... Uh, uh, just as, I, as you were going through, I was coming back to our original beginning presentation and setting up the problems and just showing how you've seen already all, the, all of the tools of psychology with learning implemented into the program. So you can t tie those into why not have more effective learning and here's the answer. But also we talked about the administration and some of the problems we deal with with accreditation and licensing pass rates huge. But also within this, for your own self as a student, and definitely as a helpful tool for professors and administrators as a whole, everything can be kept track of. You'll take a pre-test before you start your, study, your, your full domain. <coughs> Say abnormal psychology, that domain is an EPPP domain, and you might have a, an advanced psychopathology class of some sort. So you start that domain, you click your very first time into that class, and you take a pre-test. You study, you have your whole course, at the end you take a post-test. For your own self, you can see, what, did you learn, did you improve? Those are actually taken out and available to your administration to use for accreditation also. Simply, they don't have to do anything, they get the numbers you know, for them. So, so hopefully you see the, the dilemma, the frustration that we see sometimes in psychology with this huge licensing exam and also just the burden sometimes schools have to continually have cutting edge of availability to keep track of learning. And, and we save for accreditation, but we want this. We want to know that the schools, our schools, are, are you know, achieving outcomes, that our students are really learning what they're supposed to. So hopefully you can start seeing how the Taylor Study Method answers some of those problems we had and is building on these tools that we have available to us already there in psychology. We really want every part of the school to have a piece in this process, from the administration, to the students, to the professors, to the alumni. 
And we want to, and we try to identify what your needs are specifically, whether it's accreditation, whether it's you know getting a, a large amount of information over a period of time, whether it's those that are already licensed, or not uh, already licensed, but ready to sit for the licensure, how can we make this program available to you as well uh, for a handful of weeks and maybe months? Um, and to make it, make it something that is very useful and answers some of your needs in very, very simple ways. Ideally, what we're looking to do is to allow your professors and your staff to make sure that in addition to the way that they teach, the information they want to convey, and again, nothing has to be changed about that, we want to make sure that they get a chance to teach they want to, the way they want to teach, a school gets to maintain its theoretical orientation, the curriculum gets to remain what they found to be the best curriculum for their school, while assuring that that core content is identified early on and presented to their students. And then the students get an early opportunity to practice with it, to have a sense of greater mastery over time through that space learning. So it's really a win-win-win all the way around. In essence, what you get is about 800 content areas in 11 domains. There's about 2,400 simulated EPPP practice test questions that you're going to be going over, uh, detailed rationales for each of the questions, lessons customized for each of the courses that we showed you earlier. These uh, flashcards are professionally written flashcards by our content experts uh, from uh, various different institutions. You get the ability to start uh, with a new class each week if that's how your school is going to be set up. And there are customizable key terms for each of your classes. So That's pretty much it. I, I, I don't remember seeing the video component too. So for the 100 most difficult Good. content areas, we, we got experts to come and teach using video. So I don't remember the names of some of those um, those guys. Who's the guy that did the neuropsychology? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so some some top people in the field in that particular area would come do video for us for right. students um, to be able to re to understand the really complicated terms. We uh, before anybody comes into like Julie was saying earlier, the way that we came into this was to first start with a preparation program. Uh, for the EPPP. Roughly, people could study in a number of months that they wanted to, but the average studying is about four months for those that are out studying for the licensing exam. For those students who go through a program like this first, though, that study process is a little bit more condensed because they've already got the base knowledge already from doing the heavy lifting during their graduate work. Um, what was I going to say about that? Um, Something about the videos? Oh, the videos. Thank you. Um, the uh, what we did, when someone comes into our program, they take an initial assessment exam to find out where their strengths and weaknesses are. Because of the decay theory and being out of school for two, three, sometimes five years, students have different levels of mastery uh, remaining here, remaining there. So we do an initial assessment exam that allows them to find out what their strengths and weaknesses are. And from that, and we're talking almost maybe a million questions, uh, maybe I think 700,000 questions taken overall. We were able to kind of distill that down and find out what the most difficult key terms were and we're in the process of creating, uh, of creating videos for those 100 most difficult key terms with some of the content experts that Julia was talking about. Just super people. And you can actually go online, YouTube it right now, Taylor Study Method, and you can see some of those folks on there right now doing that. Uh, it's really exciting. At some point we're going to have videos for each one of our key terms. Uh, that's just a little bit more of a lengthy process. So, well guys, we'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have, uh, either virtually or for those in the room. I think I'll, uh, thank you very much, first of all. Uh, I think I'll start with some questions submitted. We have lots of questions that have been uh, submitted from the virtual audience. I'll start with a few of those and let the uh, in-person audience uh, gather their thoughts. And the very last one that came in might be the best place to start. What was your inspiration for creating the program, and how did you decide what type of learning methods would lead to the highest retention rates? It was out of my own panic and my own angst <laughs> uh, and studying for my exam back in 1995. Uh, I had finished my, uh, uh, my internship. I did my training in uh, Hawaii, where I live, and did my internship at the hospital, and then I did my postdoctoral training at the hospital. And uh, I had uh, a small window of opportunity to get te uh, to uh, test for this exam. Back in the day, they only gave it twice a year. You can take it four times a year now, but back in the day, you could only take it once, uh, twice a year, April and October. So if you failed it in October, uh, in April, you had six months to wait, put everything on hold. And so I had moved back to California for a brief period of time, and I realized that I only had one month to study for the exam. Uh, 
So I had uh, some materials that I were handed down to me, which is typical what happens. And I attended one of those weekend workshops, and I found that I had some really good material, but I had no way really to prepare or study for it all. And so what I did in my own panic and my own angst and my own time urgency is I began to think about what we do as psychologists that really enhance some of the learning and theory and memory theories that we're talking about. And uh, I, I began to tap in, well, let's, let, let's chunk and cluster this. Let's use the, my, my, my flashcards in such a way that I could go over them with some repetition and some elaborative rehearsal. Did a lot of writing out of things and trying to get, uh, grasp the core main areas, which is the mind mapping involved with that. Um, what else did we do uh, when I first started out? Let's go back over some of the things here I had done because it all comes out of this. Um, the primacy of recency, that was really important. The test is weighted uh, uh, by the way people practice psychology now. When I took it, there were a lot more PhDs and less PsyDs. I'm a PsyD. And so the test was heavily weighted in uh, uh, stats and test construction which is not now, it's less weighted now, the more PsyDs, more, re, uh, more clinical work going on, which is to most of our benefits. Uh, but I had to really learn this material very, very thoroughly. So I thought, well, wait a minute, what if I organize it in such a way where the stuff that's gonna be most on the exam was learned first and reviewed last, kind of on the, on the best on my memory. So the primacy and the recency piece of it was how I organized my final review. Uh, the testing, I took a lot of test questions. I was learning the content, so the mediator effectiveness hypothesis, the testing effect, those are all piece of it. So it's out of my own angst, out of my own panic, and on my own short time frame and a month of study. And uh, like Julie, I was very happy when I got my acceptance letter and I passed. It's a very, it's a very good day. And very then, good day. Um, he, it became known amongst his friends, he's told me this before, you know, other people coming to him and saying, what did you do and can I copy it? And so that was part of it also is, is as he would help more and more people around him just naturally, then he thought, this is really great. We need to continue this. Why not use, we've talked about this before, why not use psychology? Well, there's so many tools and just so easy to forget, you know, um, the effectiveness of it. So Most times we just sit down on our lazy boy with a highlighter and our material and a cup of coffee, hoping that we're going to be learning it. But what I wanted to do was to get a very active process in learning. And if you can, if you can have a, a, a kind of a roadmap to do that, that's very active, and make that learning process an active one, it makes it much more enjoyable, and you're learning things. So I wanted people to have a beginning, a middle, and an end to each one of their study sessions. Whereas before, if I was reading just content and highlighting, I was hoping I was doing enough in a time frame. One of the things we do uh, that we don't cover here, but you will see online, once you're ready to study for your, your, your licensing exam proper, we have a course of study that allows people to choose from prearranged courses of study, ranging from nine weeks to 20 weeks. We tell you how many study sessions you need to do each day, how many hours it's gonna take you, and how many you need to complete each week to meet your testing goal. So everything is laid out for you. And I wanna take some of that guesswork out of it, so all you needed to do was turn on your computer, point and click, and you're good to go. So that's how it came about. Great, thank you. Uh, a learner mentions the method is terrific, but he wonders, will he have access to the, I don't know if this is a question for you or for our psychology staff here, um, will he have access to the Taylor study method content for courses that he completed before the method was incorporated into the program? Absolutely, we can make something uh, happen with that. That's not a problem at all. Okay. We'll be happy to contact him. Have him just uh, contact uh, Dr. Grimes and we can uh, work with our administrative staff and we can make something happen, absolutely. And this is a, a very similar question. This is uh, from a student who wonders, uh, will they continue to have access to the information that they studied or completed within courses after they've completed the courses? Uh, she's wondering if she needs to print out flashcards or domain summaries or whether she can go back and, and continue to have access to it. Sure, there's different layers of learning depending on where you're at in the process. So. Um, the things that you always have access to are the flashcards. Now the flashcards are editable, so you can put into those fl flashcards whatever you want, save them to your computer and have them forever. The actual content in the, in the order, you know, being able to get on the website will eventually, you know, you won't have that. So whether you are graduating and moving on, um, you may not have access to all of the information, but for sure you always have access to the flashcards. So we tell students to make use of those, save them to your computer, print them, keep those. What, we, what we've started developing, and, and sometimes we develop based on what's needed. So if we hear something's needed, we may be able to do something for you. But what, what we have is a program for alumni that uh, you'd be able to, even though you've had this layer of, of learning, be able to access, yes, 
going in and out, I can tell. You'd be able to access as an alumni uh, a s program specifically for you, for example, where we've implemented it now, but what if you skip, you didn't get, you know, four or five of those domains and you're graduating. So it'll be a special program for those that are alumni um, to be able to take and, and there, there may be a cost involved in that, but it will definitely be not compared to if you went out and actually bought a program to study for the EPPP. So there's lots of layers of options and if we know a school needs you know something to provide it for their students, then we're willing to work with the school and, and, uh, and meet that need. Our main goal is that you pass your EPPP and get yes. licensed. That, that's why we exist and that's why we're doing this. I wanted to give students, my colleagues, a very different experience in their preparation than what I had. It's, uh, it's a process I think sometimes gets fraught with kind of smoke and mirrors about what the best way to learn is and you've got to have this, you've got to have more of this, you've got to have this package. And everybody learns a different way, but I thought what if we just made this very step by step, very straightforward, tell you what you need to learn, weave in these theories of learning and memory, put the, uh, the, the test questions there in such a way that it really enhances it, and you get equipped not just to become master in the content, but a really practice and critically thinking test taker. So with those that are going to going through this process, as long as you're part of the school here, we will make the uh, package uh, very, uh, very, very affordable for you. Uh, you had asked me that in an email earlier. And so that program will be significantly uh, reduced for your students. All they need to do is let us know that they're a Cal Southern student and we'd be happy to do it. And if something happens, like Dr. Hayden was saying, that they only have, you, know, you only finished a certain course here, but you have some other ones, we'll fashion it for you where you'll have access to that so you have a complete learning experience and get fully prepared. I'll ask one more question from the virtual audience before I turn it over to uh, the in-person group here. This is an interesting kind of, kind of pointed question. A learner wonders about directing her learning toward taking and passing the licensing exam. She, uh, it reminds her of the debate in secondary education about teaching to the test. Mm -hmm. So she's wondering, uh, concerned, if that focus might have some sort of limiting effect on her comprehensive learning experience. Well, to be honest with you, we do teach to the test. <laughs> we want to teach to the test. And we want your students to have the opportunity to be taught to the test. While at the same time, you folks are teaching your curriculum the things that you feel are important as professors, as administration, you get to teach this while we get to teach the test. A school cannot teach to the test. A, a, any kind of accrediting body coming in will look at your curriculum and make sure that this is not just test related. I take that back. It's going to be test related, but not so specifically to the test that you're not covering a broad, comprehensive understanding of what the, uh, uh, what the material psychology is. So while you get to teach that, we get to parallel that, and we do specifically teach to the test. So there's a nice kind of collaborative approach there that as a school, you can't necessarily do, but we can, and we want to. And it's a nice, it's a nice kind of adjunctive component to what you're doing as a school. Yeah, I'm just thinking, um, I, I use it in the school that I'm the dean of also, and just started. So the very first teacher, you know, she barely knew what I was doing. She was excited, but she didn't know quite what it was. So she has her regular textbooks, her curriculum. She's ready to teach that first night, but they log in to Taylor Study Method and do this a this aspect of studying. So, so you would have the same experience you would expect in a psychology degree program. You know, what is it going to take for you to be a competent therapist, a competent psychologist. We know that you could be an excellent psychologist and terrible test taker. So the goal is whoever is out there competent, that's up to the schools to decide. The school is the gatekeeper for our profession. If you have somebody that's dangerous or incompetent or cannot communicate worth beans, you're, you know, the school's gonna, gonna decide that and and um, hopefully protect our profession. If you have a competent student, then on the flip side, we're going to help you pass the test so that you can be out there and be licensed. Yeah. Part of that studying too, I, I, I didn't mention it, but those study sessions comprise of five key terms. Reviewing that narrative, listen to the audio. What we recommend you do is you read the narrative one time, then go back and read it a second time <laughs> as you listen to that audio. Look at your flashcard, tweak it any way you want to do, print it out, Look at that mind map, and then take that 15 question quiz. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to complete that roughly. Uh, so that's kind of a time frame. People go, oh, it's gonna be so much more work. No, no, not really. It's gonna take what you're doing right now and deepen your understanding and appreciation for what you're learning in your class and in your readings. So that one extra hour, two extra hours a week is really very, very helpful in that layered 
uh, space learning opportunity. Uh, and it's very manageable, very doable. Okay. Any questions from our audience here? OK. This learner is on week six of her experience with your method, and she's very pleased with it. Uh, she wonders about subjects that, uh, that a student might really struggle with. And she, she put statistics down here. <laughs> and I imagine there are others that would also. Uh, any tips or resources that you might recommend for increasing reading comprehension or, or, comprehension or content uh, mastery with these subjects that might just be particularly difficult for a student? Go ahead. Oh, well, I, I was thinking that resource room and, uh, you know, Dr. Graham Taylor actually does consult sometimes, you know, in those really, really difficult time frames and we have other consultants. So one thing is if there's ever a problem that you come across that you have studied and it just doesn't seem to stick, you cannot seem to understand the concept, that's the time you email us and we'll get somebody to either describe it for you or help you understand it. Um, we, do, we do have other resources, but I'm not thinking on hand, but there's some online resources in particular areas that we found along the way. Con so, University. yeah, I was thinking that's what I was thinking of. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but in general, we could try to find you, you know, a resource if it's a specific subject we know. Yeah, just one around that right now is uh, Con University. You can do that online. I think it's Con, K A H N. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Con.edu, I think, but K A H N. And they have a, a, a really cool site where they have this video and it's kind of live. I don't know what it actually is called. But uh, they're actually drawing everything out for you. He talks about, you know, finding standard deviation. He talks about it and he draws it out. And it's right there. It is beautiful. Almost like what your professor would do up on the board if he was in front of you. So those adjunctive kind of uh, uh, sites we can refer you to as well just to take it one step further if you need it. And also, too, you know, you're not going to master every subject in psychology. You're just not. Uh, I had some stats class and test construction classes and I, I knew it really well and then like Dr. Hayden said, I forgot it the next semester. Uh, I knew it well enough to pass my exam and every now and then when we talk about research, things come back because we're talking about doing some further research regarding the EPPP and learning different learning styles and how to help people additionally in that area. But those things are still require me to do a lot of work. So you're not going to memorize and master everything, but uh, this will help you do the things that you're going to need to do for the test. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've had a couple questions come in on this. If, uh, if a learner is to go by every feature of your method, about how much time can he or she expect to, that to add to their ordinary study time? Sure, yeah. Let me just, uh, uh, so one study session is about 45 minutes to an hour. And depending on the number of uh, assignments that your teacher has created for a number of lessons your professors uh, assigned to that syllabi, uh, that's what it's going to be. So 45 minutes to an hour per study session per five key terms. Yeah. I have a question in regards to the TSM EPPP forum versus the um, the resource. Um, what types of things would students be able to find within the forums? You mentioned that they may be students from other schools and things like what types of resources might be there? I didn't hear the question because I was listening to them. Oh, <laughs> uh, on, on the forum, things that they get to experience. Uh, I don't know too much about the forum. Okay, I'll talk about it. Uh, the forum, they get to go on and ask just a variety of questions. The, uh, ideally, we're trying to create uh, a community uh, that allows psychologists just to start talking. They might talk about their graduate experience. They might talk about where they're stuck on the test. Uh, students more and more as we come into the schools, more and more get to talk about the lessons. Uh, every now and then we get students kind of helping students. Uh, I get stuck on this. What do you guys think? And there's some really good dialogue that goes back and forth. Uh, they start looking at different sites, different job opportunities, and just things that you, know, you and I might talk about if we sat down for coffee together. Uh, whether or not we're both studying for a licensure exam or already licensed or we're students, those kinds of dialogues get, uh, get brought up uh, in, uh, in, those, in that forum. The resource room is more about, again, resources where we're looking to point people in directions that they have uh, some interest in. And if you want other additional areas that we can provide you resources for, just let us know. We'll be happy to find some great sites like the Khan University I was mentioning earlier. We can direct you to those sites. Uh, and all you need to do is give us a call. Be happy to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have one in the back here. Hi, I'm Janine Thomas. I'm enrolled in cultural diversity, and all of my questions have already been asked and answered. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, I mean, I was always a great test taker, so that really wasn't my concern, but I'm tired of not learning and knowing really what I'm studying, so thanks. This is really helpful. I've noticed that it's already um, instantly feeling a higher comfort level that I'm going to be able to actually um, integrate what I'm learning <coughs> into my career. It's not just about passing the test then for me. 
Um, That's great to hear. Can you tell me what the current pass rate is for Cal Southern and if you've projected the increase uh, in pass rates in the next four or five years? To be honest with you, I don't know. I can't recall offhand what the pass rate is. I'm sorry. Um, and how do we access the public uh, sure. records you on can, that? You can go to ASPPB.com, excuse me, .org, and uh, if you scroll down, click on students, they'll take you to a very highlighted and boldly uh, recognizable uh, part where it says compare, compare schools, uh, each of pass rates. It's right there for you. And all the schools that uh, Julie was saying uh, in the uh, uh, United States and also in Canada. You know, I, I liked what you said about uh, not just becoming you know, a better test taker and learning this content just to pass your exam. It's, it's far more than that. What I loved about testing, when I was going through school, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm sure it's, it's not that dissimilar. I, I was going Mach 2 with my hair on fire. I had, you know, I had kids, I had other things, um, and, uh, I had four classes at a time, and th there was just so much thrown at you, and you don't get a chance in that period of time to really kind of regurgitate and regurgitate and go over and really appreciate all the wonderful parts of our field. It is a wonderful field that we are in, and it's an exciting field. And what I loved about the study process is I got to come back to this term and say, wow, I, I remember this one I got, you know, from this professor or that professor. I really loved him or her, and I loved the content, but I didn't get a chance really to sit with it and kind of ponder on it and learn it a, bit, a little more deeply. And what I found, because I was practicing doing some work at the time, I was able to take the things that I was learning into my clinical practice right away in a really beneficial way. So I love the idea of not just getting ready for this exam, but to really deepen and enrich and uh, have an appreciation for what it is we do and all the different areas that we help people with. Reaching their potential, whether it's an, as an administrator or whether it's as a boss or a husband or a wife or parenting. All the things that we can influence and impact in this world, it is really exciting. So uh, we're in a pretty cool field. Hi, thanks. That was very, it's a very interesting presentation. Um, I was born and raised in the state of New York where they teach to the test. Mm -hmm. So oh. to me, that's, a, that's, that's kind of the way that, that I, I learned. But I'm thinking logistically, in, and maybe not, I think this, this is a very, very good uh, program for distance learning because you can separate the test from the teaching. Uh, but I'm wondering, and I'm thinking, Julie, of your your colleague that you helped through the, the beginning of the method. How did she prevent the students from getting the questions and doing the questions while she was lecturing? Because that's, that's sometimes a problem in, in yeah, regular education. Professors, you know, tend to want their creativity to be left alone. So um, I, I would want them to, to give some form of credit for participating in this. And, and it tracks, like, if you as a student have gone through a study session and completed everything, it'll track that. I don't know if you've really learned it or if you've really paid attention. I just know that you have this opportunity to learn. I know the. it seems like the student population here is going to take advantage of that opportunity. There may be other colleges with students that would not care to take advantage of the opportunity. So I can't judge wh whether you're really learning, but I can see how you're progressing through and how you're doing on the exams and things like that. So that's done outside the classroom separate from any other learning. So for mine, it's on-site. So, so the professor teaches as normal. The interaction in the classroom is a, as normal. Separate from all that at home, they have their, their projects they still have to do. Separate, they do the studying, and the teacher can pro watch them progress through the studying. So it, ha it doesn't interfere with the in-class time. It is um, depending, I've seen, They've arranged a little bit different what they require from the student um, because of the time it takes. Um, each class is kind of different on that, on whether the student professor would adjust something or not. But I leave a little bit up to the professor how they want to do it. How logistically do you do that? I mean, do you say, hey, guys, you can't, you can't be on your laptop? Oh, laptop. oh, goodness. We, that's a whole nother fun, <laughs> exciting thing is, is um, for me as a professor, I walk around the classroom. I have no problem, and I, you know, like, what are you doing? Get off your phone. Poor, first class, I didn't even know the guy, and I was yelling at him for being on his phone, but, you know, in this day of, of age, if you have everything in the classroom, that's always a problem. So that's just a separate issue, not, not with this, is, is 
you should not be, what, whatever's going on in the classroom, you need to be, you know, interacting um, with that. Now, if there was a purposeful reason in class you were using that, that's fine. But otherwise, no. As a professor, I walk around, and I have other professors that, that have creative ways of keeping the students focused. That would not be what we're thinking at all. This is for at home, your online study time. What we recommend, too, is that people, uh, let's say you got a class assignment week two, I see what your assignment is for me as a professor, and then I see that there's a study activity, which is what's, what, what's going to be our program. So ideally, people are doing that reading ahead of time, doing our program ahead of time, that activity, and they're coming into that class really ready to talk and engage and uh, have some really good content with which to uh, kind of have that process of learning be a little bit deeper. So it's all done outside. Good question. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. We have about a dozen questions coming in on this one topic. Let me see if I can synthesize them into one giant, helplessly complex question. <laughs> um, are there any plans to implement the method either earlier in one's education process, perhaps to master's level students, or also to other programs, perhaps, for, or licensing exams, perhaps uh, counseling, uh, marriage and family therapy? And just to add one last <laughs> little element to this, and is there even as it exists, is there some overlap so that one might benefit if there, we have a, a, a student uh, who wrote in from Georgia who's going to take the LPCC exam in Georgia, is there, is there significant overlap that might benefit her there? Go Sorry ahead. about that <laughs> question. Go ahead. Uh, yes and yes and yes. So we talk all the time. We just have fun because, you know, there's so many areas we can use this and we get excited. So we've had ideas that it'll just take time, you know, to implement. But we've already started using this in undergrad. So, so there are schools that have implemented it in their undergrad graduate and postgraduate. So imagine the retention at the end of that. And the idea is we'll have different stages, but, you know, just giving them a glimpse. But you don't usually take human development in your doctoral studies. You know, you may have an advanced human development, but sometimes you'll, you'll have some of that information earlier on. And so we make it available undergrad, graduate, and postgraduate in some schools. That's already existing, and we have ideas. Uh, for, for me, my husband, you know, he's more in business, but he loves psychology. And, and what organizational industrial psychology brings is so effective. So, so he wants us to create a class just for him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to read just the best. I mean, you think of a textbook as just the best, now just condense that. So just the best out of psychology is really what you have in these key terms. You know, if the EPPP does what it's supposed to do, you know, uh, then, then you have this, the best information in this. So the idea at some point would even be, allow this opportunity to anybody who wants the tools out of psychology. And they could just go through start to finish in a whole domain, you know, as needed. So we'd love to see it expand in all the different areas we could. LPC, MFT, all those other licensing exams, there's going to be a huge base that's the same because you have law and ethics, human development, you know, abnormal psychology. Diagnosing is the same whether you're an MFT or a psychologist as far as what's in the DSM until they come out with the DSM-5. You know, it's all the same. So there's some key differences you would not have you know, in this program that's on an MFT licensing exam. But there's a huge, huge uh, portion that would. So for me, my master's students, some of them are going to MFT. And they still take the program and they love it uh, because that's still that it's not wasted information. That's all extremely useful information. But they know they'll probably do some more studying towards the, that particular exam. Also, too, around that, the idea of being able to go into other professions, uh, other, other areas. Um, this method, when I first developed it, uh, we didn't have the content at that time. I had a study method. So I taught my colleagues for about 13 years, pro bono, how to study the other company's materials. So I gave them a whole course of study and I had to take that content and weave it into the structure of, of, of uh, learning and memory. Like Julie's saying, these theories are applicable to a number of areas. So the idea that we can take this structure and insert a content into it. I've helped people take, uh, prepare for their GMAT, for their, uh, the objective component for their uh, bar exam. Uh, I helped a doc friend of mine uh, study for one of his boards using all of these theories of learning and memory with that content. And I taught him how to study it. So it's got a lot of application. On behalf of the entire universe, I'd like to thank you both for a very compelling and informative lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're so fortunate to have you.